because this is their visitation, this is their day of visitation, this is their time. Everything they need is going right by them, and they don't know it. And he's weeping because of that, that they're going to suffer needlessly. Paul says things like, everybody who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. There will be suffering. It's part of the Christ experience, quite frankly. So there is suffering that is necessary in the formation of Christ in us. There's suffering that's unnecessary, because for some reason, we've missed it. If you think of it this way, Luke Luke is the one who says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, you shall receive power, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. I like to think of that as, you know, Luke saying, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, you're going to receive power, dunamis, and you're going to be witnesses. The Greek word behind witness is martyr. You're going to be witnesses. You're going to die to everything about yourself in order to bring the witness to Jerusalem, which is the people right around you, the closest people to you. Judea is like the next sphere. People that are not necessarily close to you, but acquaintances, maybe the people that you work with. Samaria, the people you don't like. Welcome to the kingdom. You're going to bring the good news. You're going to be a witness. You're going to die to yourself for the people you don't like. And the uttermost parts of the earth, people you don't even know. You're going to go to Africa. You're going to meet people. Lay down your life for them. This is what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to do this so that they don't have to suffer needlessly. So that they don't miss the day of their visitation. Because when you miss the day of your visitation, you suffer needlessly. Nobody likes suffering. So let's just suffer for the things that we have to and the things we don't have to. That's kind of Jesus' weeping. Luke makes sure that we get that. It appears as though leadership hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. There is there is an element of almost like, uh, let me put it this way, Jesus has got, especially during this time, he's got betrayal around him, he's got denial around him, he's got doubt around him, he's got all these things going on around him. And I think Personally, they're the same kinds of things that every leader has going on around them a lot of the time. Jesus had a way of saying, you know what? doesn't matter. I'm going to serve every one of them, and I'm going to lay down my life so they don't have to suffer needlessly. That was the example he's given us. I remember a uh, Francis Frangipan. Anybody familiar with Francis Frangipan? Mm -hmm. um, he told a story once. Uh, he was a pastor for a long time, but now he's like an international speaker. Very godly man, very much into unity, trying to see churches come together. In fact, he won't speak in a city unless he has an invitation jointly from various denominations. He, he won't go to one church. You've got to convince him that the church in Rochester wants him there. Anyway, one of the places when he was speaking years ago in the early 90s, he tells a story about being a pastor of a church and having the names of all the people in his church on a piece of paper and their needs, much like our prayer list a bit, and how he would pray over them and pray over them, you know, every week. He would be crying out to God and saying, God, look at this. What a mess. These people, what a mess. When are you going to do something about it? And he felt very clearly the Lord say back to him, I died for them. When are you going to? In other words, what he was trying to say was that in all his crying out to God to do something, God was saying back to him, why don't you lay down your life and you get involved in their lives and do something? So what I'm trying, I guess what I'm saying is that leaders in general, a lot of times are not in that dying to their own. They've got the betrayers, the doubters, everybody around them. And instead of laying down their lives for them, they're trying to figure out ways how to get them kicked out of the church, they're troublemakers, they mark them, they're all kinds of stuff. It's very interesting when you think about it. It just wasn't the way Jesus ministered at all. He saw every single person around him, every single one, as a child of God. Maybe messed up, but a child of God. He was never threatened, crucified. Very huge difference. I mean, I don't know. But in this particular scenario, we've got Jesus crying for them, a mob that's going to turn on him and everything else, and he's crying for them. That's a spiritual thing. You can't put, I mean, you can put, you know, we've got scriptures that say weep with those who weep. You know, you can make it a commandment and you're being obedient to the word. I'm going to cry because the word tells me to. Tears don't really work that way, if you know what I mean. You do know what I mean. It's a spiritual thing. Luke is the master of including parables. And I heard a parable in terms of what we're talking about right now, of a young woman walking along the side of a river. She's walking along, the young woman that she is, she's thinking about who she will meet, who she will marry, and what that will be like, and 
the river is very quiet and peaceful. And she looks ahead of her, and down along the riverbank, there's an older woman. And from where she's walking, she could see that it looks like the, ri the river's troubled. Where she is, it's not. So she makes her way to the woman to see what's troubling the water. And when she gets close enough to the woman, she sees actually that, you know how when brush comes up, like a branch floats in the river or whatever. There was a branch that was in the river that made its way to the shore, and this old woman was reaching over into the branch, and when she would touch the branch, she would like shake a little bit, and that's what was causing the water to ripple. So now she knew why the water was rippling, but she couldn't quite see what the woman was doing with the branch. So she got even closer, and she could see that what was happening was the older woman was reaching down, and when she was touching the branch, actually, there was a little spider that she was trying to help off the branch because it would go out into the water. and So she was trying to help this little spider get off the branch. But every time she got near the little spider, it reached up and bit her. So when it bit her, she would shake, and she'd pull her finger up and suck the poison out, and then reach down and try to help this little spider again. And it would bite her again, and she'd reach back up, suck the poison out of her finger, and the younger woman watched the older woman do that for a couple of minutes, and then said, excuse me. And the older woman looked at her and said, yeah. She said, seems to me you keep reaching down and touching that spider, and that spider bites you, but you keep going back and getting bitten. I don't understand. And the older woman just smiled at her, and she said, well, the spider's nature is to bite. My nature is to save. So should I die on this river and lose myself? And the young woman didn't have a clue what she was talking about and walked away thinking about it, but really didn't get it at all. And the way the little parable ends, it says, and so the older woman just hoped that her smile would have meant something to the young woman. It's an Eastern parable, so it takes a little time to kind of think about a little bit of what the older woman is saying, that my nature is to save. If I get bit in the process, does that mean that I should stop, that I should actually deny my own nature, the nature of Christ in me to save people because it hurts, because it costs me something? So do I stop? Do I lose that? Do I let that die so I don't get bit anymore? And that's what the parable obviously is about. And I think this is what Luke is saying and what Jesus is saying. He wasn't crying for himself, though. He was crying for them. Move on to uh, Gethsemane. It's interesting. Remember, Luke's a doctor, right? He's the one that records in the garden that Jesus was sweating blood. There is an actual medical term for it. It's very, very rare, but it's caused by stress, anxiety. So Luke's got a medical condition written down. Luke's got Jesus. He's the only one that records that Jesus picked up Malchus's ear after Peter cut it off and puts it back on the side of his head. Luke 22, would you read verses 41 through 48? And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but thine be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. The blood, that's, that's unique. But Luke is also the only one that talks about an angel coming and ministering to Jesus at that point. The only thing I want to walk away with in Luke, Jerry, would you go to Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, something Paul wrote. Remember, Paul and Luke traveled together. Luke wrote the book of Acts, which is a lot about Paul and Paul's missionary journeys and stuff like that. I hope this is going to be an encouragement to us. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through the worthless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes of God's people in accordance with the will of God. The thing that Jesus promised us at the Last Supper was the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, the Intercessor, the Consoler. All I want to say is this, is Jesus himself in the garden is seriously praying, and it sounds like he's at the end of his rope. I've got to believe that at one time or another, all of us have felt like we're at the end of our rope. If you haven't, you will save you a lot of Bible study time. Mm -hmm. And what it says in the garden is that Jesus, he's doing the stuff, but he's really, really worn out. Don't know how else to say it. So the Father sends an angel. That could happen for us. When you read about the ministry of angels at the end of Hebrews chapter 1, I think it's verse 14 maybe, angels are spirits that do minister to us. But what we read from Paul, Paul's saying, listen, 
There are some times that we just really don't even know how to pray. I know you've been there. We just don't even know how to pray. It's just like to show up feels like a major achievement, actually. We don't even know what to pray. And Paul's saying, listen, it's okay because the Holy Spirit who is in you will intercede on your behalf. You know when you're laying there and you're just, you, you can hardly get a groan out. The Holy Spirit can interpret that and put it into words that you can't even form and make your requests known before your Father. I mean, this is a, this is a wonderful and beautiful thing that Paul is describing.